This is Hollywood Outside, our weekly entertainment podcast, where this week we're going to look at upcoming releases, including Broken City, The Last Stand, and Mama. Our From the Outside In topic this week is what makes a great movie villain, as well as what are some of our favorites. We're going to have the latest in movie and TV news, including our own trivia segments. My name is Aaron Peterson, and with me today are my fellow ho is Justin McCumber. Hey, Aaron, how was Vegas? It was... I was it was fun, man. Thank you oh very much. God. Brian <laughs> Williams. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. And Scott Clark. As if I haven't spent enough time with you the last three days. Yeah, that was way too much quality time. <laughs> to answer your question, Justin, Vegas was fun, but we lost. For all of those that uh, didn't catch it on live, we, we lost. We didn't win Best Movies Film. <laughs> Always next year. <laughs> you're going you're to hum the Incredible Hulk song? <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> but we do appreciate all the listeners that got us uh, to the awards. Do we? Because obviously they didn't do the job. <laughs> Just kidding. JK. He can, as long as you say JK, it's okay. You can say anything right. you want. And winky, wink, I'm out of con at the end of that. <laughs> but if you follow Justin at all, you realize this is a pretty long-running joke, so there might be a little bit of truth behind it. The, I wouldn't say so, but I'm not saying it ain't. It was it was a good time. Uh, and also, we want to congratulate all the other nominees and winners of the show and it oh, was yeah. they say it's an honor to be nominated but it does suck to lose <laughs> <laughs> you'd think you'd be used to it oh, no I, i'm used to it in life not at an award show <laughs> <laughs> met some cool people though anyway, yeah, we did meet some some pretty cool people so i want to thank uh todd and megan for putting that together and bully we did finally get a bully screening in uh the rockford chicago area it'll be january 29th at 7 p.m. So look for the website for more details. What's been new with you guys? Obviously, Brian and Justin couldn't make it to Vegas because they were too busy being party poopers. Just living life, man. L I V I N. <laughs> Hope you brought your wood screws. <laughs> <clears throat> now I'm just doing that stuff you find so boring, Aaron. <laughs> I make one good joke, and now he's going to make it make me feel sorry for it for the whole night. <laughs> it wasn't that good. It was that good. They uh, left. It was kind of good. Well, they're they're a simple audience. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into movie news, guys. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Christopher Maloney have both joined Sin City 2, A Dame to Kill For. As well as, and this kind of surprised me, Josh Brolin has signed on for Dwight, the character played by Clive Owen in the first movie. Yeah, there are a lot of stories in the Sin City uh, collection. The ones that they put in the film were just a few. So there's a lot more they can do with this. The the uh, A Dame to Kill For story actually takes place before the um, movie, the stories that we saw in the Sin City film, uh, in which the character that Clive Owen played did have his face changed. So actually, if Clive Owen had played Dwight... It would have been a little odd because Dwight didn't look like that in A Dame to Kill For. He had a mm. facial, uh, what do you, plastic right. surgery to to change his appearance because of things that had, had happened. So having someone else play him actually makes sense. And Josh Brolin is an amazing actor when he's not getting arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct. So uh, <laughs> glad to have him in it. But Joseph Gordon-Levitt, he's one of those actors that I really think is going to be remembered as one of the best actors of his generation and he seems to be making all the right moves to do those films that have a lot of heart and you know academy kind of nods yet also able to occasionally jump back and do a a really juicy kind of movie that i would consider a sin city film and uh, i can't wait to see what they do with this Uh, uh, i love the first sin city here's hoping that we get a lot more of that is that why Clive Owen isn't doing it? Is it because of that difference in the in the books? I, I have no idea. Hmm. I would assume that they wanted to go with someone else because of that, but you know, how many people are gonna, you know, remember or know that that was the case? I'm really not sure. But if they do any of the stories uh of Sensei that follow um the first uh a dame to kill for, then they could bring Clive Owen back. Who knows what they're gonna do or what the negotiations were. I wonder if he'll do another impression, a la Men in Black. Uh, oh, Josh Brolin? Yeah. Just I know, he, did, he did a pretty good uh, Tommy Lee Jones. That was about the only good thing in that turd. <laughs> wow, there's a sci-fi movie you didn't like. Ugh, a turd. Uh, what an earth. <laughs> John Hawks, Yazine Bay, I hope I said that right, Will Forte and Tim Robbins are aboard the Jackie Brown prequel, The Switch. 
Elmore Leonard's novel that showcases Ordell and Lewis. That was uh, Samuel L. Jackson and Robert De Niro's characters from the, from the original Jackie Brown movie. As they snatch a developer's wife to extort a ransom. I guess just kind of a set this up, Quentin Tarantino will not be doing this. Yeah, he's got nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with this. This really, this kind of movie really doesn't appeal to me too much. I wasn't that big of a fan of uh, of Jackie Brown per se, but it's got some. I mean, it's got, I know it's got your your man crushed in his Quaid. It, so <laughs> no, it doesn't. Why it's it does not. He actually backed out, so I wasn't even going to mention him. That was you. That's on you. You're not. You're not putting that on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> now, does Tarantino own the? He doesn't own that property. It's not like he didn't write it. He just owns the book, the Jackie Brown. I mean, he got the rights to Jackie Brown. He didn't have the rights to all of it. Okay. Right. Elmer Leonard's got a lot of books, man. Okay. Yeah. So. And Jennifer Aniston is going to be playing the wife. So I don't know if that scares or makes somebody yeah. excited. That yeah, sounds good. I like Elmer Leonard's movies. It wasn't the Be Cool and Get Shorty? Weren't those also Elmer Leonard? Yeah, I think so. Stories. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I kind of liked Jackie Brown more than most people, but uh, I, I'm kind of looking forward to this. I like the actors involved, and um, I like Elmore Leonard adaptations that have been done up on film. So, uh, you know, count me as one of those people that's looking to see more. I, I'm really interested in that. I, I was when I saw Jackie Brown. That was one part of the movie I would have liked to have seen more as to the backstory between those two. So that to me is interesting. I don't know if these these guys are going to be as good as those two, but. It's worth a shot. Hmm. Ubisoft, who have recently announced films for Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell, have now announced that Ghost Recon is being prepped for a movie. You guys think they're biting off a little bit more than they can chew? I don't know if biting off more than they can chew is is the problem here. I think, and, and again, I'm, it's hard for me to speak to this because I haven't played the Ghost Recon video games at all, so I don't know anything about the story or if it's interesting, but I've kind of avoided them just because they just look like another war shooter to me, and I'm not, not super interesting, but... Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you adapt that without it, it just being another Call of Duty ish or, or uh, what's that that war movie you, that we gave a bad review? Act of Valor. Act of Valor. Imagine it being something like that and not really being tied to the video game franchise. What do you think? I have no no desire. I, I'm kind of getting sick of them announcing a bunch of stuff that isn't being produced yet. Mm-hmm. At least with was it Splinter Cell was Tom Hardy. They they locked in an actor for Michael. Assassin's Creed. They locked in Michael Fassbender. Ghost Recon is just one of those. It does lend itself to film. I mean, if you've ever played it, you, you know it lends itself to film. But I, I just think they're getting too ahead of themselves. They, they seem to be announcing more projects than they're actually releasing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I kind of want to see them have success with one before they just start bringing before a whole they bunch start of make them. all Ubisoft movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like somebody just says, "Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Going to do this," and doesn't do anything. Exactly. That's right. what I'm worried about. Well, and you have to wonder if some of this isn't just trying to generate some faux uh, interest in the Ghost Recon property itself as a game property and just using this movie news to, to kind of do it. Well, a little late. Didn't, didn't it, the recent one come out like um, six months ago? I think he's saying like jolt sales again. Get it going oh, again. Get right. people reinvested in it. Ah. Keep that name in the public consciousness. So you, basically you leak something that you're going to do, pay attention to the feedback that you get from it and determine whether or not you're actually going to follow through with it or not. That makes yeah. sense. <laughs> it's possible. They, right. they didn't lock in an actor for this one, so it's possible. I'm much more interested in the Splinter Cell one of all of these. Oh, I I, I think Assassin's Creed or Splinter Cell yeah. I would like to see. Ghost Recon, that's just a generic formula. So. Assassin's Creed such a mess of a story, though. Splinter Cell, I think, would work mu- be much easier of a property because it's yeah. you know, basically that, your standard Mission Impossible type movie. Mm-hmm. That would be great as like a comedy musical. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Just throwing that out there. Guillermo del Toro has been busy. Oh, God. God. What? Say it for me, Brian. Guillermo. Guillermo del Toro. Whenever I say it like that, I feel like I should have a southern accent. <laughs> He's not French. But he has announced that DC's Dark Universe is going to happen, and it's being written right now. And for those that don't know what this is, which I didn't, it's essentially DC's um, Supernatural Justice League. I could not be more excited about this. I'm, I, I, I don't have a deep well of knowledge about the the Dark Universe stuff. I've read a little bit of it when DC kind of rebooted everything and the, the the whole Fifty Two deal that they did that basically took all of their franchises and started them over 
Uh, one of them that they did was Dark Universe. And, and like you said, it is. It's it's a Justice League, but it's made up entirely of supernatural type characters. It's it's not about wacky superpowers and, you know, all the tights and flights that go with it. But the characters are more like, and this, it, it, what's interesting is this could actually be a, a way for the character Constantine to come back into films. Because John Constantine, uh, that the film uh, Reeves did... Um, is a member of this organization. There's also Swamp Thing, Dead Man, the Spectre, uh, two magicians, and a father-daughter pair called Zatara and Zatanna. So it's 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 still a, a team of heroes, but more about the mystical, the supernatural, and not about technology, gadgets, and superpowers. And I, I think there's a lot of promise in that, and I'm encouraged that DC is willing to take this, this sort of property and put it up there to 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 give their film franchise more than just the 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 technology and the superheroes but to offer something that so far really the marvel movies uh, maybe outside of blade and even blades more science than anything uh, hasn't really offered and that's more of the spiritual aspect of these of character superhero characters and having guillermo del toro it, heading it up or talking about it is exciting as fuck because I mean that dude. He just excites me with almost everything he's doing now. What do you guys think they're they're going to be pushing too many of these out now? That's what I'm worried about. That's... We've already got a lot of comic book movies, and now we're going to get a lot of comic book ensemble movies. At some point, it's gonna it's gonna burn out, and it's gonna affect the ones that we do love currently. I've been thinking that for a while. <clears throat> I've said that in previous shows. I, I've not to knock something that you're interested in, but seeing Swamp Thing and Constantine on the screen together just seems really weird to me. Yeah, but you know, the thing is, well, if if it was done poorly, then yes, I th- I, there would definitely be a danger of this sort of thing just kind of muddying the waters. But if all of these properties that we've been talking about for years come to the silver screen with the same sort of success that Iron Man and the Avengers did, then as far as I'm concerned, they could bring one of these movies out every fucking week. And I would be in the theater every week watching it because I would finally be getting all the things that I loved as a kid. If they fuck it up, sure. Then there's a room for everybody to come in and say, oh, they're doing too much. It's burning stuff out. But I guarantee you, if they do quality films and they deliver on what they're promising, then I don't think anybody would be complaining. How could you complain about constantly getting things you love and that are done well? As far as the characters go, yeah, sure, Swamp Thing, John Constantine, what do they have to do together? If they do the film right, then you'll find out exactly how they work together. Yeah, that is pretty random. <laughs> no, but these people really don't understand Swamp Thing. The, 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 the thing they think they know is based on some film from a long time ago or occasionally seeing the character on the, the racks. Swamp Thing is, is actually one of the, the deepest characters DC has. So few people know it because the name is just kind of silly. Read the uh, Alan Moore series of Swamp Thing. It's, it's, it's pretty fucking engrossing. For me, it's not even so much worried about them making a poor quality. It's more of like kind of like what Aaron said is making it too much. Oversaturation. Oversaturation because in, at the end of it, they, they're in the business of making money. And if they keep making too, much, too many of these and getting the people that aren't like you and me that are interested in this kind of thing from the get-go, the people that had never heard of Iron Man and have never heard of – man, I can't imagine this, but people hadn't even heard of Spider-Man or whatever – until these movies came out, are going to shut like, your mouth. Oh, just it's just another comic book movie, and then those people are going to stop seeing it, and they're going to stop making them all together. The thing is, I mean, the thing that scares me is that I just don't think DC has the people that make the that kind of give the green light or make the big decisions. I don't think they have the caliber of people that Marvel does. I agree with that, agree. and that that worries me. I'm not saying that. I mean, they've got a, their recent history is pretty good with you know with the Batman and and. But what they've been doing with Superman up till, of course, we haven't seen this, you know, the new one yet. But for the most part, their decisions with their movie choices and, and the way they've taken these movies has not been very good over the last, what, 20 years? It's not been very maybe? successful is what I would, I would say. Because there are – Constantine had its Right. That's probably a better and, term is, yeah. is, is successful, not necessarily good. I mean, it, good is very subjective. But, but – they haven't had. They haven't been able to create that success that Marvel has. 
to where, okay, bam, now let's green light all these other, these smaller people that, you know, these smaller characters that, uh, that we haven't really seen before. Here's what I, <clears throat> what I would say to that. And I think what Brian's alluding to is that DC has done very well with the established franchises, Batman, Superman, that's it. Everything else they've tried to launch, they haven't done well with. So that's, I think, where a lot of concern would be. I don't even know this particular brand, so it could be fantastic. It could suck. I have no I, I honestly have no idea. Um, Justin's read it, so I'll take his word for it. He says it's very, very strong storytelling. I'm interested in it. It sounds interesting. But I'm also concerned because of DC's history, like Brian said, and oversaturation. There's so many comic book movies anymore. Mm -hmm. But take this into account. Christopher Nolan... Guillermo del Toro and Zack Snyder, those are three pretty talented motherfuckers, all of them right now working with DC in one way or another. I think DC's past failures will hopefully show the way that they shouldn't be going, and instead they'll follow these more respected uh, and pretty well accomplished uh, movie writers and directors onto a better path. That's my hope. Well, speaking of things that need to go on a better path, the Godzilla reboot, remake, whatever they're calling it, is getting a rewrite from Walking Dead creator Frank Darabont, well, Walking Dead producer, writer, Frank Darabont, before it's a uh, spring start date. Does that change anybody's opinion about the movie, which we were kind of bagging on a couple weeks back? No, not really. I mean, it's it's Godzilla. There's really only so much you can do with it. But I think really the they're really kind of uh, trimming the fat here. I guess they've got a kind of an overabundance of producers or something. They're letting a couple <laughs> of them letting a few of them go or a couple of them go what have you and it's really kind of a uh it looks like it's going to end up in court where i guess these producers said you know hey we're not expecting your buyout so we're going to take you to court that was kind of what what i picked up what's kind of going on with this which really shouldn't affect what's on the script or what maybe makes it on the screen but um i don't know it's it's godzilla I'm probably one of the few people who actually liked the the last one that with uh, Ferris Bueller. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, that you, was terrible. You mean the one where they lost Godzilla in the city and they laid thousands Look, of It's studies. not a perfect movie. Somehow he <laughs> no. ducked out an alley. Yeah. <laughs> he took a left. I can't shake him. <laughs> Are you sure you went left? Fuck, I went right. Yeah, I know. You got, you got helicopters and airplanes circling New York City. Mm -hmm. Not to mention Where'd there's a go? giant. Yeah, you know, a, a giant. 200 foot lizard walking around that can't find, but and, uh, and 20,000 baby lizards. It was entertaining. <laughs> but bringing on Frank Darabont to rewrite this, that's, I mean, that's kind of like taking a bat to kill, you know, a bug. He's such a talented writer. I, I don't, I, I, it's kind of like what Brian said earlier. It's Godzilla. I mean, what do you, what can you really do? I, I almost think the, the harder you try to, to make it, I don't know, serious or complex or deep, the more you kind of ruin it. The beauty of Godzilla is he's fucking Godzilla. Just a big fucking lizard who New stomps York. on shit. Tom, yeah. Well, in that, on that token, zombies are just slow walking dead people. Yeah, and but he, the walking dead's not about zombies. It's about the, the human characters and how they turn on themselves. The zombies might as well just be any enemy. It's not about them so much as about it is the people that are left to survive amongst them. Oh, can you imagine it Godzilla's could be chasing North Koreans? Godzilla's chasing right. a group of people, and they stop and having a nice conversation about their future. <laughs> how how are we going to escape this giant lizard? I don't know. Let's talk about our home. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to watch the people running from Godzilla. I want to watch Godzilla stomping on those people. <laughs> Welcome to Brian's Trailer Park. Well, about the only thing scarier than watching a lesbian porn session with Roseanne Barr and Kathleen Turner is demonic possession stuff and pretty much you could just ask Justin. He he hates God and this shit still scares him. It does. <laughs> wow. On my on March first, uh, the last exorcism two comes out and it picks up a little while after the events from the first one. Uh when the evil demonic force is back and uh, it's got a new vengeance and a whole new game plan for the young Nell Sweetzer. Now Aaron did you even see the first one or? I did yeah. finally. I, I didn't care for it, but okay. it, it was okay. It had a moment. It had its moments. How's that? All right. Well, does this one, does this trailer kind of excite you even a little bit to go see it or what? No, I'm not a big fan of seeing sequels to movies. I didn't love or really, really like the first time. 
it, the trailer looks really good. It really does. But the first trailer looked really good, and I didn't care for that one. So uh, I'm I'm excited to see it. the The trailer looks very well done. It looks like every other kind movie of this kind. But to be fair, this is more up Justin's alley, so I would actually throw it back to him. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. What what I really like is that when I heard that there was going to be a Last Exorcism two, which I guess the first one wasn't the last. It's stupid title shit. <laughs> um, I thought what they were going to do is they were just going to do another version of that, where they find another person possessed out in the the woods, and some guy comes along and exercises it. Uh, when I saw the trailer, though, and saw that not only is it now not a found footage type movie or faux documentary, it's uh, following the same character from the first film, the the girl who was being exercised. Uh, knowing that they decided to make a more traditional film, but carrying on her story really kind of excited me in a weird way. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really curious to see what they do with this. It's filmed in New Orleans, which is a city I used to live in. Uh, I love it. So I, I want to see what they do with this area and the, the spirituality of that city, how it comes to play uh, in it. I'm Yeah, I, I will definitely be going to see this. There's some really cool imagery in, in the film as far as really spooky, really in, intense, creepy stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, I'm, I mean, I, I'm definitely going to see it because I'm like you. I love watching these movies that, that make me squirm in my chair, but I'm, I'm nervous about it going from the documentary aspect. Of, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a, good thing or not it's i don't know that's ever been done a sequel been done that the different Blair style Witch change too. oh yeah that worked true. out great yeah that's a good that's a good point <laughs> insert sarcasm there <laughs> I, I do like that they actually got the same actress which i don't think was anybody before the first movie was she no Mm-mm. and um she really does that creepy possessed girl thing really well i really love uh, justin's point about the title they should call it the really last exorcism <laughs> Well, not to take well, it the back. last exorcism, my bad. I wasn't done yet. <laughs> well, there was like four never-ending story movies, too. So. Right, or, you know, not take it back too far, but Final Fantasy 15 now or yeah. something. How, how final can it fucking be? Well, again, uh, The Last Exorcism 2 opens on March 1st of this year. <laughs> Maybe if they do the third one, it'll be The Lastest Exorcism. <laughs> <laughs> the really last one. We swear. It's the laster of the last ones. <laughs> we promises. <laughs> oh, man. All right, well, uh, if you've ever made fun of magicians, such as David Blaine and Chris Angel, and God knows I have, then you might be excited to see the incredible Burt Wonderstone with Steve Carell and Steve Buscemi. Uh, The two Steves play a couple of longtime stage magicians whose sales are dropping, and so they try to compete with this over-the-top street magician played by Jim Carrey, uh, with some help from Carell's boyhood idol played by Alan Arkin. Now... I've seen Scott pull a rabbit out of his butt, but wait a minute. No, my bad. That was a gerbil, but it was still, it was still impressive nonetheless. But um, what, what do you think about this one? It seems like magician stuff, uh, magician movies are, I guess that's kind of one of the next sub genres here coming out here pretty soon. But what'd you think about it, Scott? I went into this trailer knowing literally nothing about it and sat and watched it. And I laughed my ass off of this trailer. It looks hilarious. Over the top, but in a good way. And three actors that are, to me, are just hysterical. I I can't wait to see it. Are you guys? Am I alone? Does in this? Steve Carell look weird? In he the did. Look like he had like he, a whole bunch he, of. Thick I was going to bring that up. He looks like Bill Bill Nighy or Nighy. <laughs> yeah, he, his like nose is different. He, he's very golden. Like he's been tanning for yeah. about sixteen That's years. Vegas. Yeah, well, these Vegas guys, they all look like they've been spray tanning for forever. It almost looks more like what I would have expected. Will Ferrell to do kind of a blades of glory yeah. type film mm-hmm. yep. but with steve carell in it he has really yet to do a movie that hasn't entertained me the guy is just fucking funny what i do like about steve carell at least from this trailer is i agree with you that's what i kind of thought it was going to be is a total will ferrell kind of movie mm-hmm. but he he does it so much better than a will ferrell to me i honestly think he does so. will ferrell, will ferrell better no he will does ferrell. he does that kind of comedy better because he can play it with heart and I don't right. think Will Ferrell does a good job playing Hart. Right. I think he can be absurd and funny. Because that's really what it is. It's absurd comedy. Mm-hmm. And he can be totally absurd. Absolutely. But I never buy the heart of him. Mm-hmm. Right. You, you still feel for the, the character. Yeah. Steve Carell, he can be as ridiculously stupid. Like, what was the, the idiot in Bruce Almighty? You, you still end up liking oh, him. Evan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, Evan, thank you. Um, you still end up liking him, even though he's a total tool. Mm-hmm. He's just He's much better at that kind of comedy than... Than uh, than than Will Ferrell and I think this trailer looks hilarious, mm-hmm. absolutely. And it's a new concept. I just refreshing all around. I, I was just good surprised by the trailer. I can't wait to see it. 
that it's taken this long for Vegas magicians to get spoofed. Hmm. <laughs> well, you can it's one of those things you don't really have to do. <laughs> they kind of do it themselves. Yeah, they kind of do it themselves. <laughs> All right. Well, the incredible Burt Wonderstone opens on March 15th uh, later this year. And if there's anything else you want us to uh, jabber about, just send us an email over at feedback at the Hollywood Outsider dot com. You can also reach us on Twitter at H underscore Outsider and on Facebook at Facebook dot com forward slash the Hollywood Outsider. And don't forget, you can also get your official I'm a Ho T-shirts at the Hollywood Outsider dot com. Stump the Ho. Stump the Ho. Each week, one of our hosts poses a trivia question to the remaining hosts and attempt to stump their fellow hoes. And you guys listening can play along. This week it's my turn. And we are going to change it starting uh, with, with this episode. We are going to start answering it at the same time. So you don't have to wait all the way until the end for those people dying. <laughs> so you guys ready? Here's your question. Ready? Okay, that's where I ask. Are you ready? We're ready. We're, we're so ready. We can't wait for you to go. <laughs> can you dig it? Uh, we're going to be talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Last Stand here in a little bit. So this is an Arnie question. <laughs> Arnold, of course, starred as the Terminator in that famous franchise, but he also turned down the lead role in what became another huge film franchise that launched another famous actor's action career. What actor slash role was it? Was it A, Sylvester Stallone as John Rambo, B, Bruce Willis as John McClane, C, Mel Gibson as Mad Max, or D, Kurt, Ris- Kurt Russell as Snake Plissken? Uh, I'll say A, Sylvester Stallone and Rambo. Okay. Justin? I'm going with B, John McClane. And Brian? I'm John McClane. Oh, um, I'll go with Rambo. You go with Rambo. So Brian and Scott both said Rambo. Justin says John McClane, and the answer is John McClane. Fucking, I knew it. Justin wins. Can you imagine Schwarzenegger? Yay, Schwarzenegger suck walking it, around. Brian, suck it. <laughs> it was wrong. I'm, the question was wrong. I'm virtually teabagging you right now. How was the question wrong? Because I always get the right answer. <laughs> You're an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, let's go to the big screen where this week we don't really have uh, any new releases because nothing came out except Texas Chainsaw and none of us wanted to see it. So we could talk about Django Unchained again. Yeah, we could just keep talking about Django or Jack Reacher or one of the other. Yeah, we we never did cover how how good uh, Samuel L. Jackson was. So. We did, and I cannot believe we forgot to talk about that. He was awesome. He was awesome. That's true. If you guys listened last week, we didn't mention Sam Jackson, and he was fantastic. <laughs> and all of his dialogue, we can't quote. Yeah, pretty no, much. Not a word of it. <laughs> not <laughs> not a word. <laughs> and Brian, unfortunately, with his southern accent, can't quote anything in the movie. But we no. can't quote Sam Jackson at all. <laughs> yeah, just... we could. that's right. Aaron, we could both read the same lines from the same script. I would physically, I would actually be arrested. Yeah. <laughs> the perception is completely different. Yep. Yeah, that's what happens when you're a sympathizer. <laughs> <laughs> but I did see Arbitrage, which is about a rich hedge fund manager <laughs> who, has done, who has done a few nefarious things, makes a serious mistake that threatens to unravel his entire world. It was written and directed by Nicholas Jericke, and it stars Richard Gere. Richard Gere is awesome in this movie, and it's hard to explain the plot without giving away what happens. Because the whole plot is about how his world unravels because of this incident. But I can't tell you what the incident is without ruining the the mystery of the movie. So try to go in and watch it watch it fresh. It's it's very much a, a dramatic thriller. It's not as boring as it sounds. It sounds kind of boring because hedge fund manager doesn't sound very exciting. But it's basically a guy who he, he means well, he tries to do well, but he makes a lot of uh, shady, shady judgments that cost a lot of people a lot of futures. So, uh, Susan Sarandon's in it as his wife. She's fantastic. She plays kind of the, I, I pretend to be unknowing, but really I know everything that's going on wife, which was great for her. And she still looks great. What is she, like 85 years old? <laughs> she looks great. Scott's shaking his head. He's, yeah. he's wrong. She and looked- uh, Tim Roth <laughs> plays a cop investigating some stuff. He is fantastic. I love Tim Roth. Put Tim Roth in every movie. I wish they would, because he just makes every scene energetic when he's in it. And um, uh, just to paraphrase, because it's supposed to be a quick review and it's already too late, <laughs> Richard Gere is the best I have ever seen him. And really? yeah, he, I mean, he's been in a lot of movies, but he's usually that quiet, reserved guy. He never really raises his voice. He's always very cool and calm. And I mean, he loses it a few times, and I've never seen him do it, so that's probably why it's so surprising. But he nails it every time he does. I don't think it's a great movie, but it's a pretty good thriller if you can find it. 
<laughs> so six six point five out of ten, if you can find it. It's still in red box. Last time I checked. So. Yeah, and next week we'll be back with uh, reviews of Gangster Squad and Zero Dark Thirty. So we'll have new big ones next week. But uh, what? Oh, don't go dirty. <laughs> don't do it. Who are you talking to? Yeah, good call. Let's go to the box office. Millennium Films is already moving forward with a Texas Chainsaw 3D sequel. I don't know if it's Texas 4D. I don't know what you're going to do, but they're going to do a sequel because it made $21.7 million this weekend. Damn. Who's happy? Who's happy? Lion Gate. <laughs> yeah. How much did it cost to make that movie? Oh, those things are low, but it, I would imagine. Probably 5, 10, 20 million, something like that. Hmm. Yeah, you spend $200 for a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> And go well, from it was from... 3D, so there were two cameras. There you go. <laughs> right next to each other. Ooh, we'll make it look like it's coming at you. Uh, Django, <laughs> Unchained. <laughs> Django Unchained held on strong at number two with $20 million. That's made $106 million to date. It's going to be Quentin Tarantino's biggest movie ever. So, good for him. And Sam Jackson. <laughs> the Hobbit, $17.5 million for $263 million. Les Mis, $16 million for $103.5 million, which that's actually a pretty big hit itself. And parental guidance, nine point seven million made fifty two million already. It's a hit. Who called it? This guy. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, what do you think, Justin? You waiting for a sequel? You want to see parental guidance two, or would that be PG thirteen? No, thank you. Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got three films that we're going to be talking about today, all of them opening up on January 18th. The first one, Mama. Mama is an upcoming horror film directed by Andre Muschietti with uh, Guillermo del Toro serving as executive producer. Man, his name's coming up a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on Muschietti's uh, Spanish language short film, Mama, I'm assuming, with that uh, little accent mark over the final A. Mama. He pr yeah, he put out, <laughs> God, is that not annoying in those trailers? Mama. Uh, that came out in 2008. <laughs> A couple, Annie and Lucas, are faced with the challenge of raising Lucas's young nieces who were discovered in a forest after being lost there for five years. Nobody knows how they survived in the forest for that long. Soon it becomes apparent that the girls are being haunted by a ghostly woman they believe to be their mother. Mama. Uh, now, yeah. Brian, Brian, it, it often seems like you were raised in the woods, and, <laughs> uh, but hopefully by a woman more motherly than what's in this film. Uh, oh, does wow. Mama strike a little too close to home for you? A little bit. It's uh, it kind of looks like a home movie uh, in some fashion. <laughs> a home movie. I kind of I'm a Guillermo del Toro fan, probably as big as you are. All you've got to do is say he's got. I don't even care if he directed it, wrote it, just touched the film that it's made on. <laughs> you put his name on there, it's going to get my attention. I've got to give it a little bit of a little bit of clout, so to speak. The other side of that coin is uh, these movies that that show the. The scary imagery, it's almost like they ruin a lot of the scary parts that would perceive to be scary in the movie. So you okay. you know what to look for beforehand. So mm -hmm. that, that worries me somewhat about this movie is that uh, a lot of the quote unquote surprises or scary imagery is going to be uh, kind of spoiled, so to speak. So it does intrigue me. I don't know if I'm going to rush out to see it, though. Yeah, these that's this one's got one of those trailers that I think gives away uh, a bit too much. What about you two? Pretty much all the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say the same thing. It, all right, it, then, I... Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I I think the trailer. I'm so sick of that trailer. Every movie I go see in the theater, that trailer plays. Mama, and I'm so sick of hearing about Mama. I don't want to see it now. Honestly, that's one of those cases where the trailer has burned out my desire to see the movie. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the mama thing is actually kind of spooky, but it, yeah, I agree with you. It's too much. It's been overdone so much that now it's not, yeah, it's just kind of like, eh, it's all right, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mama is old. Yeah. I only saw the trailer once and I'm sick of it. So. it is, it's just, it's one of those movies where it's not interesting enough to me. Mm -hmm. it, it just seems, all right, so you got Tarzan and Jane hanging in the jungle. And you got Mama taking no, care like, of him. It's like you took Nell and then turned it into a horror movie. Head <laughs> <laughs> in the way. It's a Nell, it's a Nell reboot. <laughs> it's a reboot. Hey in the way, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> Anybody else got anything to say? I can't speak now. Go ahead. Guy uh, Joe. <laughs> all right. Well, next up, we've got Broken City. <laughs> now, this is, a crime drama. <laughs> <laughs> this is a crime drama directed by Alan Hughes, starring Mark Wahlberg and Russell Crowe. Former cop Billy Taggett begins following the wife of the New York City mayor and uncovers a much bigger scandal. Um, Scotty, this movie seems like it's a pretty paint-by-numbers sort of a crime film, but since you've really only seen something like two movies, it might feel a bit <laughs> fresh to you. Any interest in this at all? <laughs> Not even a little bit. I, I, I wasn't interested from the beginning, first time I saw the trailer, and the more I see it, I just it just looks very cookie-cutter and not interesting to me at all. Sorry. I can tell you that now my friend Tyler actually got, saw a screening of it, mm -hmm. and he said that it's very basic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, it's it seems pre it. Yeah, pretty much exactly what the trailer seems. Um, and Mark Wahlberg's pretty good. Russell Crowe is pretty good. But the movie's it's pretty by-the-numbers thriller. Mm -hmm. So it's just, disappointing. I still kind of want to see it, though, because I really like Russell Crowe. I don't – Mark Wahlberg, you know, we've talked about this before. He doesn't – do anything for me you know i like him but not enough to go see a movie for him yeah but do you like him like him well not in the biblical sense but I was... is russell pro becoming al kilmer no <laughs> he's becoming marlon brando at this point i mean every time i see him he's a little bit heavier he's a little bit thicker a little bit angrier yeah but 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 you know what i mean he, he... It's like he's he's still got that name recognition that that he'll pull people in just because of his name, but really he's not done much. No, in a while that's true. Probably a beautiful mind was the biggest real or the last real big hit he had. Because that was it after. Just seems like a paycheck okay. movie. Mm -hmm. Every, everybody's doing it just to earn a, a buck and then move on to something else. Uh, do you, I mean, how long do you? I mean, it's almost like he's on that path to like within about the next five years he's going to be doing those straight to DVD action buddy cop movies with the the Rizza or fifty cent or <laughs> Or maybe he can he's in Les Mis and they're making some pretty good bank on that and I'm he's... fair to yeah, point yeah, but he was good. not the strong point of that movie by no, any No but his mean. name's attached to it above the title. Ugh. And he's in Man of he's Steel. He's got his own movie poster. Let's be yes. honest. Let's stop talking over each other, bitches. And All he's right. a, and he's also in Man of Steel. Those are a lot of big supporting roles he's got. He's not a big star anymore, but he's a, a lot of supporting roles. All of Val Kilmer. <laughs> All right, last one, appropriately titled The Last Stand. Uh, this is an action film directed by Kim Jae Woon, and it will be Arnold Schwarzenegger's first leading role since Terminator 3 back in 2003. He's going to play Sheriff Ray Owens, who's a former LAPD cop who moved to the sleepy border town of Somerton Junction after a bungled operation that left him racked with failure and defeat. After a spectacular escape from an FBI prison convoy, Gabriel Cortez, the bad guy in the film, who's also the most wanted drug kingpin in the country, is hurtling towards the border at 200 miles per hour in a specially outfitted car. Of course. With a hostage and a fierce <laughs> army of gang members. Between him and the border sits Arnold. Uh, at first reluctant to become involved and then counted out because of perceived ineptitude of his small town force, Owens ultimately accepts responsibility for the face-off. Aaron, this seems like a bit of a throwback to the action films that we loved back in the 80s. Uh, are you psyched to see this, or would you rather have your last stand in another <laughs> ticket line? Wow. <laughs> I, see what you oh. did. I see what you did there. Mama! Uh, I don't want... I, I don't know. I do want to see it, and, but I'm nervous because it looks so bad. It looks like Commando, you know, <laughs> kind of movie, which I like Commando. But you don't you don't really like Commando, you know. It's fun. You get into it, but when you leave, you kind of feel bad and dirty. Let like, off some steam, Bennett. Yeah, <laughs> I lied. <laughs> <laughs> See how I don't even do I don't even do the whole quote. I just let you let you go think for it yourself. I didn't. The, the, when this trailer first came out months ago, when we talked about it. it I, I, I got the feel it was at least a little bit serious, and the trailers now just make it look more and more silly. Like where they've got that car, like a car that goes two hundred miles an hour. Really, <laughs> come on, <laughs> and not driven by Vin Diesel. Exactly. <laughs> now, if they would have had him in it, maybe, maybe I could buy it. No, yeah. actually, the car does go two hundred miles an hour. Yeah, it's a Corvette, special Corvette. Well, I love those cars. You're kind of killing my whole yeah. argument here. Well, that's because it's a stupid argument. Well, stop, stop shitting on his point. Well, couldn't you just like throw a rock in front of it then, and it just flip? 
I can't imagine. Yeah, motorcycle. I can't imagine it's too hard to stop to a, a car. <laughs> Shoot we'll the tires. See what they do in the movie. Oh, I yeah. know what they'll do in the movie. He'll get an arsenal. Um, he'll he'll come back. They'll make a couple age jokes. <laughs> he'll, he'll come out with some giant machine gun that that no human man could actually lift in real in real lo- real life. Maybe a Gatlin gun, like Gat- the one he's got on the cover of the poster. <laughs> Exactly, like a Gatling it's, gun. It's as old as he is. Yeah, and then he will blow the fuck out of everything that walks. That's what's going to happen. And Johnny Knoxville's going to act over the top like he's 18, but when he's actually about 49. <laughs> yeah, he's waiting for Jackass 4 funding to, to kick in. <laughs> we, we, we think he should get back to the West Virginia mountains and go interview some more people. <laughs> That's right, we do an update on the White family. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Well, of these three films, Mama, Broken City, and The Last Stand, which of these will you most likely be out to see January 18th? Brian? All that being said, I want to see The Last Stand. I like I like a lot of shit blowing up. I like fast cars. Johnny Knoxville still cracks me up, even though he's too old to be playing that role that he's playing in this movie. But, I'm, you know, it's it's a little bit tamer than The Expendables, and I love that type of movie, so... I'll take the last stand. Well, it wouldn't be hard for it to be better than the Expendables, too. Scotty. <laughs> we won't pull that argument. <laughs> Probably Mama, just because I have no interest in the other two at all. Um, and I do like supernatural stuff on occasion. I don't think it's going to be good, but it's a lesser of three evils at this point for me. Hmm. Aaron? I want to see Last Stand because it looks like Battleship kind of good. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> God, it's like Battleship and the Expendables had a baby. <laughs> That's true. And named it Justin. <laughs> Abort that fucker. Just <laughs> kick it down the stairs onto a wire hanger. <laughs> oh, God. I can't well, there, I there go our female listeners. Bye-bye. Yeah. Uh, I got to go with Mama. I'm, I'm going to be sitting next to Scott watching that. Uh, the Last Stand looks fun, and I'll definitely check it out when it hits video. But if I'm going to actually walk into a theater, I, Mama will probably be the one uh, I'll, I'll, I would be most likely to go see. So it looks like it's two to two. Okay. Well, you can always hear us on iTunes, Zoom, Google, listen on your Stitcher radio app. Give us a thumbs up if you do, or any RSS feed, as well as thehollywoodoutsider.com and rockfordcollegeradio.com Thursdays from 4 to 6. Uh, what's this movie? What's this movie? Each week we play ours or our listeners suggest a clip from a movie. And if you think you know what the clip is, email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com or send us a direct message on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. We will announce those who got it correct in the air and give you a proper whole shout out. Last week's answer was my pick and it was When Harry Met Sally. Oh, that scene is makes me weep. Every time I watch that movie, it is one of the most romantic scenes ever. It is. That's actually my favorite and the, oh. my favorite romantic comedy ever. Yes. Ever. That and Joe versus the volcano. But when Harry met Sally is at the top. <laughs> Joe versus the volcano. Well, I guess I could see that. All right. Oh, it's so good. I could see that. Uh, people got it correct. Ashley, Jesse M and Kelly M. So congratulations. Thanks guys. And this week it's Justin's turn. So if you think you know what it is, and it's it's going to be a hard one, I think. I think it's a hard one. So if you think you know what it is, email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com or tweet us at h underscore outsider. Those that guess it correctly, we will give you a, a shout-out next week. Here's your clip. Uh, me and the uh, gang were wondering what was that? Can you blush? <laughs> Oh, I get it. I see now. You've been training for two years to take me out. And now here I am. Ooh, so exciting, isn't it? Okay, now let's go to TV news. Uh, not that we haven't beaten his name into the ground by mentioning him way too much, but Joss Whedon is confirmed. <laughs> He's confirmed. I just say that spontaneously. I wonder if name. you get paid every time we say his name. Do you get like five bucks in the mail or something? <laughs> I wish. Joss Whedon is confirmed to be directing the S.H.I.E.L.D. pilot, and if it goes to series, he'll be directing the additional episodes as well. Yeah, it looks like he's he's actually going to be doing as much as he can, kind of a as-my-schedule-allows type of thing going on here. So uh, he's even agreed to help kind of brainstorm 
stories with the writers and even approved cuts of, of episodes and stuff. So, uh, you know, I'm going to hand this off to you guys because, you know, you definitely uh, licked the chode of, of Joss Whedon <laughs> here. So I'm going I'm to tee this up and let you guys run with it. Justin, what do you think? Yeah. Oh, for, shit, what do you think? How do I feel about it? I think Joss Whedon's practically a god in my book. And if they want to hand him as much uh, creative control, as much direction as he can you know, offer on the TV show, how could I not want it? I mean, some of my favorite television of all time has come directly from from you know his uh, output, his eyes, his mind. And if he wants to be all over this and bring to TV what he brought to the film, shit. That's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was dramatic, and I was uh, I was letting it go. M. Night Shyamalan has signed with Fox to produce a miniseries called Wayward Pines, and it's supposed to be in the spirit of Twin Peaks, where a federal agent investigates missing agents in Wayward Pines, Idaho. Yeah, what's interesting about this is there's actually going to be there's going to be two shows, and we'll talk about that one first. Uh, but Fox has announced their intention to move into some miniseries stuff. Uh, as opposed to you know, your traditional long-running series. Uh, they're calling them long-form event series, and the two projects that they're going to be doing or that they've mentioned uh, is Wayward Pines from M. Night Shyamalan, and then they're going to be doing another one called Blood Brothers from uh, Bruce McKenna, who wrote The Band of Brothers and uh, The Pacific for HBO. Now, with, with um, <laughs> what's called it Twin Peaks, uh, Wayward Pines... Uh, they say is evocative of the classic cult hit Twin Peaks. Apparently it's based off of a novel that I've never heard of, but after reading the description of it, I definitely want to go check it out because the the description reads, um, Secret Service agent Ethan Burke arrives in the uh, bucolic town of Wayward Pines, Idaho, on a mission to find two missing federal agents. But instead of answers, Ethan's investigation only turns up more questions. What's wrong with Wayward Pines? Each step closer to the truth takes Ethan further from the life he knew, from the husband and father he was until he must face the terrifying reality that he may never get out of Wayward Pines alive. Uh, that sounds fucking exciting. And it does sound a, a lot like um, Twin Peaks. Uh, but still, I, I love Twin Peaks. So, yes, please give me more. M. Night, you know, his name is is really become synonymous with shit these days. Let's hope this will help shake some of that off because it sounds like a really cool little uh, mini series. The other one's Blood Brothers. It's about a group of uh, West Point class uh, graduates in 1861 having to fight each other through the Civil War. Um, not as interesting to me. I- I'm not as big uh, a period piece of guy, especially Civil War, as, as I am a supernatural guy. But still, it sounds interesting. And of course, McKenna, who wrote. Like I said, Band of Brothers and the Pacific, both of which were phenomenal uh, f- uh, series for HBO. That him being involved in writing it is definitely a uh, a good indicator of quality. But I don't know, Wayward Pines, Idaho. I get to check this out. It, it does sound interesting. I mean, I was a big fan of Twin Peaks for at least the first season. Yeah, and it kind of went off the right off the rails. But I'm, I'm interested to see what they can do with it. I will check it out because it's a TV series and it won't cost me anything. But M. Night Shyamalan, I won't pay for anything he does. So he's basically got about eight minutes to <laughs> to impress me. And that's all I'm giving him. If he doesn't get me in eight minutes, I, I walk. I, 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 walk. I don't have to do anything. I just turn the channl. You want to start, that's what your wife said. <laughs> start placing your bets as to when Fox is going to cancel it, like mid-season? Well, no, this is going to be like a miniseries. So well, it's going to be very short form. So it's just going to be like a few episodes. Right. And it's already going to be filmed. Which is good because then, at least if it sucks, it'll suck quickly. <laughs> the Oscars are going to spotlight James Bond, with with which they really don't do very often, with a uh, tribute for the 50th anniversary because it's the longest film franchise in history. I think it's really cool that they're doing that. Like, I've I've been a, a fan of the the Bond films that I've seen since the since the Brosnan days, but uh, it, it's it's a little odd to me that they're doing that. I know 50 is the big round number or whatever, but there's at least two more Bond films coming out with Daniel Craig and I don't see them killing that franchise anytime soon it seems something that would have been more well, since the latest one is the biggest hit ever and it made a billion bucks right I, it'll probably be okay no, no no I'm not saying that they're gonna they're gonna bury it it just seems odd to like do that big of recognition now I mean not really I mean it is 50th anniversary we mm-hmm. love as human beings nice round numbers and 50 is a big fucking round number yeah that's true and how many I mean there's no other franchise that can say it 
you know, that is 50 years old. So, mm-hmm. and at 50, it's made the most money ever. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely not a, a franchise that's on the decline. No, no, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it that way. That it's on, on the decline. It's it's just the opposite of that. Is what I'm saying. It seems. But that's be... why they would be interested. Because fuck, everybody's watching this film. You know, let's try and get in on that action. I, I honestly, I, I'm not sure if it's the 50 years or because Skyfall was so huge. But one of those two things yeah. is, is making them do that. I see what you're saying, kind of. But it's it's definitely 50 years most successful film franchise ever. Hollywood. Probably owes a lot of a lot of success to the franchise itself. I mean, mm-hmm. it's created a lot. It created Born. It's created a lot of these other spy thrillers and whatnot. It's a big deal, and that's fantastic that the Oscars are actually going to take time to showcase something that isn't considered Oscar bait. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what true. really impresses me because it's not an Oscar series. I mean, nobody's going to say you know Pierce Brosnan was Oscar worthy, right? Not in those films, anyway. And speaking of, aren't they announcing the? nominees here coming up yeah they should be out by the time you listen to the show mm-hmm. so uh look for skyfall because i've heard a lot of rumors that skyfall might get a best pick nod which would be wow. huge that would be huge so uh, i hope that happens we'll talk about that next week when the nominations are actually out but we'll see bates motel the sequel the sequel prequel will apparently be taking place in present day i kind of like this idea actually i guess they they kind of tossed around the idea of making it a period of peace but it, i guess they the basic gist of it was a you know people really probably wouldn't relate to it too much. So even though it's supposed to take place before the original Psycho that was what sixty plus years ago, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of like it the fact that they're they're putting it in the in the modern day. It's it's like you kind of relate to the to the uh, the characters a little bit better. I don't know what what about you? You're you're a big I mean you're the big Hitchcock guy. Is this is this sacrilege or is this a pretty innovative idea? Well, I talked about it before that I'm not happy they're doing a prequel at all. I, I don't <clears> – <throat> some t- some characters I don't want to see the inner sanctum of why they became a killer. I just – you know, I just want them to be who they are and you have to put those pieces together. And Justin, maybe – I would think you would probably be on board with me because you're very creative. You like to write and everything else and come up with those ideas yourself. Sometimes it's better to have them in your head and not have them spelled out. That's my problem with the series. I don't really care about the timeline. In fact, I think it actually probably makes it better because then I don't associate it so much with the original film. Um, but I just don't like prequels in general for this kind of story. I I actually I I understand what you're saying, but for me in this particular um, material, this intellectual property, whatever you want to call it, I think this is a great idea. Um, I think that not only by making it in the modern day, not only does it make it cheaper to produce because now they're not having to find period cars and period clothing and period items to put on the set dressing. Now it's all common day stuff. They don't have to do any special work there. But like Brian says, it also makes it more accessible to a modern day audience. How many tweens are going to sit there and watch a show that takes place you know, back in that period? Very few would probably be willing to do so. Put it in a modern setting. Give it a the the actor who's playing Norman Bates looks really good at, in in the role. I I've loved the trailers that I've seen for it. I didn't think I would be interested in the psycho uh, psycho <laughs> psycho prequel, but I actually am. I've liked what I've seen. I I will be checking this out. I don't know when because I I did make a promise to myself that I would not watch shows until they had vetted themselves but i'm curious to see this and i'll definitely keep it on my you know to watch list i I didn't think i would feel that way but i do but i understand what you're saying and most usually i would agree with you it to me it's it's the the ones that are the biggest to me those are the ones i don't want to backstory like hannibal even though i i I know how red dragon is and i know that's actually a book that's out i just didn't i don't need it i don't need that backstory i kind of like putting those pieces to, together myself mm-hmm. if it's somebody that's near and dear to my heart. And obviously, you know, Anthony Perkins and, and Norman Bates was, and I honestly, I just wish they'd leave that series alone, but they're not gonna. So mm-hmm. I, I like thought you guys came with a new word for a sequel. Sequel. The sequel to Psycho is the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. Oh boy. Let's go to DVD and Blu-ray, Scotty. All right. We are looking at the week of January 15th. First up is Taken 2. This comes out. It's a sequel to the 2008... Taken to where? The streets. <laughs> oh, yes! <laughs> oh! High five. High five. High five. 
This is the sequel to the 2008 Sleeper hit starring Liam Neeson. Uh, Taken 2 turns the tables a little bit and has the main character needing needing help from his own daughter since he is now the one that's taken. Uh, three of us saw it. Aaron gave it uh, a $6 out of 10. I gave it six fifty, and Brian gave it a 7 uh, The Possession is about a girl who buys a mysterious antique box at a garage sale. That ends up giving her some kind of curse, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who stars in the film, must find a way to save her from that. Aaron was the only one that saw that. He gave it a $6 out of 10 it was actually kind of spooky, and I think it would be a lot better on video. Yeah, I look forward to seeing it. I, I am as well. So, To Rome with Love, I know Aaron's dying to see another Woody Allen movie. Fuck him! <laughs> <laughs> he uh, writes, directs, and stars in this movie, <coughs> which is about several visitors and uh, residents Pedophile. of Sorry. Rome and the romances, adventures, and predicaments that they get into. Uh, next up is Won't Back Down. Sorry, I got a cold. <laughs> Won't Back Down, which stars Viola Davis and Maggie Gyllenhaal. It's about two mothers, one of them a teacher who strive to make a difference in the education system. I surprisingly have not yet seen this one, but I will be. And then lastly, Branded, uh, which set in a dystopian future where corporate brands have created a disillusioned population. One man's effort to unlock the truth behind the conspiracy will lead to an epic battle with hidden forces that control the world. <laughs> I read that, and I still don't really get what that movie's about. I don't about. know. I saw it, and I said, that's totally Justin's kind of movie. I oh, I saw on. the trailer for it. It's fucking badass. Yeah, really? See? I, I knew it, that it looks badass. I've, I've got to check this out. Well, i got to check it out, but just because Lily Sobieski's in it. but so She's still acting? Apparently. I didn't know that. So, but It's kind of They Live meets The Matrix kind mm. of a thing. The whole you know hidden um, messages and you know pushing people subliminally. It's, it looks really cool. I figured that was up your alley. I'll yes. be checking that out. So those are releases for the week. Ooh, yeah. Hit me with that unknown shit. Flashback. With that, we'll move on to our flashback DVD segment. This is where one once a week, or I know once every other week, we uh, uh, bring to light a, a older or more obscure film that we want the rest of the group here and all of our listeners to check out. So this week it's Brian's turn. Brian, what do you have for us? All right, now this is uh, this is actually kind of a classic. It's one that actually won uh, some uh, Oscars, and but it's one that I don't really. I think it misses a lot of people's must-watch list, and that's uh, the illustrious Al Pacino in Dog Day Afternoon. And basically, he's a guy. His name is uh, Sonny, and he teams up with his buddy Sal. And they they try to rob a, a bank, and of course it goes bad. And uh, basically, like I say, he ends up they end up taking a bunch of hostages, and of course the the police come and surround the place, and and over the course of the day becomes a, a kind of a minor celebrity. Uh, you've probably heard references in some other movies uh, with somebody chanting the name Attica, Attica. That was from this movie. Now, Sonny, he is married, he's got kids, but it turns out <clears throat> the whole reason he's robbing the bank is he's robbing the bank to pay for a sex change for his gay lover, which back in, God, early 70s, like 70, what, five, I believe it was, uh, was pretty <laughs> pretty uh, progressive, so to speak. So it all plays out in a, in a pretty dramatic ending there. Um, it was directed by Sidney Lumet, and just uh, it's 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 prime Al Pacino. He's not really done a great role in a very long time. It's but Sidney Lumet, whatever Sidney Lumet, Lumet, whatever. <laughs> Sorry, you know. Okay, so I mess up one name. Call oh me no! Aaron. Why don't call me Aaron? Fuck you. <laughs> Al Pacino. It's a lot more credit for, of course, his Godfather roles, uh, Scarface, even a uh, couple other roles like Sin of a Woman. But this is this is iconic Al Pacino. Uh, John Cazale plays his uh, his buddy that who's kind of dim witted, and uh, and by the way, John Cazale he died early of brain cancer, but he <laughs> this is a good story. Five, he was in five movies that four of them are Oscar winners. He's what brings the magic. I'm just saying, you know, for a guy who had a very short movie career, he made some pretty good choices for roles. Uh, the late Charles Durning is in it and uh, a couple others like uh, Chris Sarandon. So, again, check it out. It's uh, 
it's one of those that's, that's overlooked quite a bit, but it's a fantastic movie. So Dog Day Afternoon, you can find it just about anywhere. That's a good choice because a lot of people know it's a classic, but they have no idea why. Most, right. most people I know have heard of it, but have never actually seen it. Hmm. That's why I picked it. Well, that's a good choice, Brian. I yes, mean, it is. I mean, Can I say, you, will you say that one more time? It makes me feel good about myself. Now let's go to our From the Outside In topic. What characteristics for you make a great film villain? And what, what we're talking about is when, when you go see a movie, what works for you? And uh, each one of us like different things about different kinds of movies. What exactly makes us go, oh, shit, that dude's evil? Scotty? I had a lot of different characteristics and because and, there's a lot of different villains that I like. But one of the ones that, that hits me most is having a villain that is extremely intelligent or smart, you know, that, that – is very very brainy knows what's going on and and it becomes like a cat and mouse game between him and the and the main character or characters I, that's always a big one for me do you want me to just keep well what do you mean in terms of you just extremely smart that's all you need yeah i mean cuz rather than, rather than like a villain that's just that's just like super powered or something like that or or you know buff and just a big gorilla or something like that that we have to go big and fight i like i like having the battle of wits kind of thing as opposed to as opposed to just a, just a straight up battle in a lot of ca- in a lot of cases but something else too like i like it when I, and i think tarantino does this the best honestly is like having likability in a villain guy is a bad guy and you and you still like him mm-hmm. you know what i mean like if if you relate to, relate to him in some some way or you kind of want to be buds with the villain there's something to be said with that. So, all and I think I think uh, disfigurement is is something cool too. Like that's done a lot. Disfigurement. In, yeah, like in Bond movies, there's always oh, like something wrong with one of the villains. Yeah. There's something that that really makes you go, "Oh, that's 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 messed up." I don't know. So, Justin, um, we mean some kind of outward sign of their inner brokenness. There you go. <laughs> yeah, like an uh, like an alarm that goes ding ding ding. I'm broken. Ding ding ding. <laughs> Uh, for me, I, I seem to gravitate more towards the really arrogant and haughty kind of villains. Oh, well, here you I know, am at your service, sir. <laughs> like a Vader, Zod, um, you know, those kinds of villains that are so assured of their superiority that they just look down on the, the heroes the entire time the heroes are going about their business. Saruman. You know, Loki, Magneto, these kinds of guys who are just really so filled with arrogance that they don't see, you know, the good guys coming when they come in. And for me, that's my favorite villain, the one that has risen so high in his own mind that the downfall is all the sweeter. Yeah, kind of kind of building on that, I, I kind of like the uh, the guy that's maybe psychologically superior in a way, the kind of... Uh, Hans Landa from Inglorious Bastards mm-hmm. kind of comes to mind where he knows what whoever he's talking to. You know, if he's asking, if he's interrogating somebody for information, he basically already knows what the information is or that at least the person knows uh, what he's trying to find out. And he's already about five steps ahead of the conversation. And to see somebody kind of psychologically playing a little cat and mouse with them is uh, fascinating to me. But also like a villain that, in addition to that, somebody who, I guess a bad guy who kind of feels like he's doing, what he's doing from his perception is the right or the just thing. And maybe it goes a little bit off the tracks a little bit. Uh, when, when, when the character has that, it's the same reason we like the hero, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm fighting for good or what have you. But when somebody is wronged or at least they, from their side of the fence, they were wronged and what they're, the steps that they're doing is, is to uh, make it right in their eyes, even though in society's eyes, or at least the viewer of the movie's eyes, it's the wrong way of going about it. That passion behind it kind of makes you, it just kind of draws me to uh, the villain, not necessarily on to be on their side, but to kind of understand and, and uh, you know, it's not just, oh, I'm bad, so I'm going to try to rule the world. Mm-hmm. So, and I, for me personally, I don't really like cartoony villains. I mean, I do like some of the comic book movies, but the over the top guys, like uh, Loki's an exception, but a lot of those other ones. 
they just seem too far. I like them, but they don't engage me. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? I really go for if I'm gonna fall in love with a villain, he has to be evil. I mean, truly despicable. I, I don't, you know, those guys that toe the line. Eh, okay, uh, all right, I can if I can see you as a as a happy guy. I want somebody evil. I want an evil fucker. Mm-hmm. That's those are the villains I love. And I love really sub, subtle and, and secretly evil guys. Um, my prime example is, is Mr. Blonde. That's one of my favorite villains of all time. Mm-hmm. Most people don't consider him a villain because it's really – it's a thriller, you know, uh, Reservoir Dogs. But Mr. Blonde, very cool, very calm. But when he loses it, he fucking loses it. He cuts a dude's ear off. Doesn't really seem shaken about it. Doesn't bother him. Tortures him. He's fine with it. You know, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't bother him in any way, shape, or form. Hans Gruber – Barely loses it at all. I mean, he shoots a guy straight in the face, doesn't doesn't blink about it. Mm-hmm. Those are the kind of villains I love. The, the ones that if you if you met them, you would never know how evil they were. Hannibal is a prime example. You know, a lot of people love Hannibal. The reason Hannibal is so cool is because you don't see how batshit crazy he is until he eats you. <laughs> Those are the guys that I, I love to see. I don't like the, the ones that give the huge monologues. Um or or they wanna, you know, show you their master plan. All oh, that shit. I hate that shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, yeah, Mr. Bond. <laughs> That's a prime Allow example. me to tell you everything I'm doing. <laughs> yes. Hold tight. I'm going to tie you to this chair as I explain my entire plan. And I probably gave you a switchblade and didn't didn't remember that. <laughs> you know, or what about the like the character Paul Reiser played in Aliens? Oh, perfect. Yeah. You know, it's a villain that you don't see coming, but when he hits, it 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 finally gives you someone that you can really kind of hate i mean granted the aliens are the bad guy per se but it's almost like hating bugs i mean that's just what they are it's what they do you really can't hate aliens because they're just doing what they do it's like hating a lion but paul reiser's character now he's the duplicitous one he's the one that's turning on his own people there's a villain you can actually uh, get you know get into hating, which kind of leads me into something I want to mention though. It's it's villains are great, but sometimes it's the henchmen that can be even better. I mean, like your Boba Fett's, the the people they send out to kind of do their work for them. Uh, those are quite often some of the more interesting. Maybe not the villain of this piece, but they're definitely an antagonist. Hmm. I think there's something hmm. to be said too for having a sense of mystery or intrigue around a villain too. Like, uh, how scary is, is Michael Myers when just for the sheer fact that you never see his actual face? Well, I mean, circa 1978, or are we talking now? <laughs> well, I mean, they have these. Yeah, the, the original movie? Right. Yeah, it's terrifying because you didn't know anything about him. Right. You have no idea why he's doing what he's doing. I'll give a little backstory with um, Not in the Dr. first Loomis. movie. The first movie, you didn't really know. You just no, knew right. he was crazy. Right. Well, yeah, kind of speaking of the, the mystery thing, uh, Kaiser, to me, Kaiser Soze is a great villain. He's there the whole time. And you... I mean, whatever. Okay, so I think we're we're past the statute of limitations here. Yeah, I, I <laughs> so, would say. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ruin the ending. But but you know he's there the whole time, and of course he's the most unsuspected person, and uh, you know he's the one. That he's this what you think is this mild, meek, timid person is actually the mastermind, the evil son of a bitch who's killing everybody off, and uh, covering his tracks. So. Like Mr. Glass in Unbreakable. Yep. You know, even though you kind of, it's Samuel L. Jackson, so you kind of anticipate right off the bat this guy's probably up to no good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but his his true villainy is not really revealed until the end, and it, he also has that infirmity that Scotty was kind of talking about. Not not so much a, a scar, but his condition. You know, his brittleness plays into his villainy, and that's that's always kind of fun to play with. Plus, you liked him. I mean, you kind of you kind of felt sorry for him. Yeah. Felt sorry for him, yeah. Felt sorry for that hair. <laughs> now, and what what about the uh, villains that are actually the hero of the movie? And, and I'm thinking Riddick and Pitch Black. Um, oh, Snake, anti-heroes? Yeah, anti-heroes. Snake Plissken and, and Escape from New York, where you think you're supposed to be rooting one way, and, and you end up, you know, they're they're really the, the good guy. Um, but they're the, the worst person in the room, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, I think I think uh, Riddick's probably the prime example, and I don't say that just because I love Riddick, but it's the easiest example i can think of mm-hmm. but he hates everybody you know i mean they try to the sequel they try to make him a little nicer but he really doesn't give a shit about anybody and he's an evil motherfucker but you end up feeling for him when they turn him into the hero and if you when you first walk into the movie you think cole hauser is is going to be the hero what do you guys think about twists like that and there's been a few films that have done that 
I don't know if I'd say it's a twist or not, but it's definitely interesting to to have a hero that you almost kind of hate yourself for rooting for or have a difficulty with. It. This might be a controversial one to say, but I would kind of put Jack Bauer in that kind of role. I mean, the the things he does yeah. to get the job done, if those were to take place in the real world, he would he he would have been through so many trials. Uh, whether it's torture, shooting innocent people, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is not a good guy, but we root for him because he's doing what he does for our good. So it's almost like we don't want to dirty our hands. Let's send this guy out there to to dirty his for us. And you you almost kind of have to feel sorry sometimes for for those kinds of heroes. And I'll put you guys on the spot real quick before we move on uh, to some other things. Uh, we're going to talk about who our favorite villains are, but I want to know who's your favorite actor that consistently plays villains. Usually that kind of thing can just pop up in your head. Who, like, If you're sitting around going, man, this guy got cast as a villain, you know he's going to be good. Because mine would be Kevin Spacey right off the bat. Ooh. Oh, gosh. Yeah, see? Trick one. Uh, we'll about come, a few seconds of dead air. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, let's go to what are some of your favorite villains? What what villains do you guys you love? You, every time you go back and watch a movie, like that's my I love that dude. That dude's a guy I want to hang out with. Maybe not you know loan him my car <laughs> or let him hang out with my wife alone. But... Alone in my car. <laughs> Get into my dream. <laughs> now you're now you're reaching, Justin. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> who's your Who's your favorite? McCumber? Oh God, I mean Hal Vader. He... <laughs> It, it's a it's a cliche choice and probably a weak ass one. But if you were to walk into my office and take a look at my Star Wars wall, it would be glaringly apparent that I've got a, a fetish for Vader that even the prequel films couldn't kill off. Um, the guy's just fucking smooth. He's got the best outfit of the bunch, the best voice of the bunch. Fucker can choke you from a from miles away with just squeezing his fingers together in your face. The fucking dude's a badass, and he's got a red sword that glows? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> fucking villains don't get much cooler than that. He just needed did say bad motherfucker on it just to be that much badder. I mean, no, I mean Vader's wallet. It's the one that's bad motherfucker on it. Damn right. <laughs> so, yeah, of all the villains ever, he is he's by far my favorite. How about you, Scott? What are your favorites? Well, mine's going to seem weird because you don't see him in too much of the film, but John Doe from Seven is like the epitome of evil motherfuckers. Like, seriously. I love it. See, Kevin Spacey, man, every time. Yeah. It just, he, because he goes, he's, again, like I said, I like intelligent, smart characters. He he knew what he was doing. He was really, mm-hmm. he was really smart. Um, I can't say I liked him, but there was that, but there was that sense of mystery or intrigue, like I said, because you don't really know why he's doing this until the, until, you know, the, the very closing shots of that movie. And, the fact that he's sitting in the backseat rocking back and forth because he's so excited about it. Mm-hmm. It's getting closer now. It's just, just, Creep, one of the creepiest, awesome villains ever. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> Brian, I'm going uh, a little, a little bit less than mainstream here. I'm going to go with uh, Ben Kingsley. Sexy who, beast. Sexy beast, exactly. Hey, Scott has seen another movie. <laughs> now it's three. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, this is Gandhi for God's sakes, and he's throwing out as many expletives in this movie as we've thrown out over the course of almost two years doing this podcast. <laughs> and just he, I mean, as fantastic as he was playing Gandhi, he is just as fabulous playing a, just a person that you just, you hate every fiber of him in this movie. And uh, I, I, he was just one of those that he was like just for whatever reason was just one of those guys who just first popped up in my in my brain, you know, kind of making me a little list here and stuff. So <laughs> I he's just one of those guys you just you just can't you just nothing about him you like, but he he, he does have a certain charisma that draws you to him. And uh you just you just can't you just can't take your eyes off of it. And it's so different from every most other stuff he plays because you you normally like the characters he plays in other movies. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, mine's Hans Gruber, Hans Gruber, sorry, from Die Hard. Just to me, I can watch a movie a thousand times, and he still entertains the shit out of me. Yeah. And he's still both funny and frightening to some degree. 
I, I can't take away from Darth Vader. I mean, you know, it's kind of hard to argue Darth Vader or Kevin Spacey. I can probably argue with Brian, but that's just because he's Southern. This Hans Gruber, <laughs> <laughs> Hans Gruber to me, I mean, aside from that fucking tree and Evil Dead, is the most, uh, my favorite villain. I love watching Hans Gruber. Alan Rickman should be a villain in every movie for the rest of time. Um, even that shitty Robin Hood movie, he made that movie so good. He really did. You know what? That's probably who I would pick for my actor that I'd like to see the, the villain is. Alan Rickman? Yeah. Oh, yeah, coming back to that. Okay, so Scott picks <laughs> Alan Rickman. I said Kevin Spacey because it should always be Kevin Spacey. Every time you say Hans Gruber, I curl my lips like he does. You know, like that. I, of course, this is audio. I can't really show you, but. <laughs> <laughs> Send us a pic. We'll put it up. There you go. Justin, who? What, what, what's yours? Uh, lately, one of the guys that always seems to be coming up playing complete assholes uh, and a guy that I, I, I've grown to love see appear on the screen is Mark Strong. Um, he played the bad guy in Revolver. He played the bad guy uh, in Sunshine, Rock and Rolla. Um, God, Sherlock Holmes, Kick-Ass, Robin Hood, uh, Green Lantern. He would have been the fucking villain if that had gotten a second movie. God damn it. <laughs> um, the guy is just constantly playing bad guys. But he all And John, uh, John Carter, he played the bad guy. And there's just something about that kind of stuffy and i don't know what it is about the english but god love them they can play the most arrogant fucking villains ever and they always do it with style and he does it with style um so right now he's if, if i know he's gonna be the bad guy i, I will probably watch hmm. all right well you guys send us in your favorite uh villains we're curious to see who you think is is the best out there there's a ton more we didn't have a chance to talk about i mean you know slasher movies that sort of thing that can actually be its own topic, horror movie icons and stuff. But Scotty loves Michael Myers. I'm, I'm surprised. I didn't know you were a big Myers fan. Oh, yeah. I'm friends with Corey Powers. How did that not happen? <laughs> um, okay. Well, let's close and let's go to emails. We have an email from Jesse who says, Perhaps it is only because Scott's choice for worst movie of the year struck so close to home for me, but I have to wonder about this category in the first place. A lot of people get caught up talking about the worst movies of the year. But it seems kind of pointless to me. Best of categories encourage people to seek out movies they might not have seen. But worst of lists just encourage people to avoid movies they that they really might have liked. I looked back at the 70-odd 2012 movies I saw this year. And the worst would have to be Battleship or Total Recall. I think it's funny. She pointed out both the movies <laughs> you guys love. But <laughs> that well, no, I hated Battleship, but I like Total Recall. So. Oh, I'm saying, but you love Total Recall. He loves Battleship. I think that's funny. Right. But that doesn't mean I didn't like them. I still had a lot of fun with both movies. They're just at the bottom of a good pack. As someone who spends a lot of time and money seeing movies, I'm, I'm careful not to bother going to ones I know I'll hate. And you guys seem to do the same. Well, yeah, we, we ain't rich. We ain't getting paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that means the category becomes least favorite of the good movies I saw. I think it's more interesting to look at biggest disappointments, which aren't necessarily terrible, but just didn't live up to your expectations for her Prometheus and Dark Knight Rises. And as a last plea, <laughs> would someone other than Scott please see Moonrise Kingdom? Justin, if you've liked other Wes Anderson movies, then there's no reason to think you wouldn't find something to like in this one. Okay, rant complete. Really fun wrap-up show, guys. She's referring to last week's uh, Ho Awards show. What do you think? I'll Just, try and see it. You'll try and see it. I'll try. I'm sure you'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've I've determined. Well, yeah, because you hated it, so Justin's gonna exactly. come back raven. Um, I've determined that I'm the the most uh, unbiased one, so I will check it out and see, tell you guys what I think. Because Justin's gonna love it because Scott hated it. Um, I really don't care one way or the other. So. Scott and I agree on what sometimes. <laughs> we both liked Pitch Perfect. We both liked Rock of Ages. There you go, Scott. <laughs> it's me and you. You are my nemesis, Aaron. Don't try and pawn that off on Scott. <laughs> uh, I agree with what she's saying, though. I mean, I, I, too, hate when podcasts or websites or forums just seem to focus solely on the stuff they hate. They really never – sometimes you see – you feel like they don't love anything. They just love to hate things. So people focusing on hate, I, I can get with that. Um, and I do think that there's a difference between movies that you were most disappointed in and then the movies that you hated. Um, you know, the movie that I hated, I really hated it. But there were some movies that I went to that just really disappointed me, but I still kind of enjoyed them. I mean, Battleship. 
I kind of enjoyed it. There, there was some silliness to be had, and it was pretty. The special effects were, were gorgeous to watch, but I was really kind of hoping it would be more of a Transformers fun, which is, a, a, strangely enough, better for me. Bay makes films that I just love. Um, but Battleship was a little disappointing. Prometheus, I enjoyed it, but it was still a little disappointing. So uh, I, I can see where there would be a distinction, and they should want to talk more about what disappointed us as opposed to just what we hated because people aren't going to gain much out of what we hate. Well, bottom line, nobody can say what the what the worst movie of the year is because, number one, it's all opinion anyway. And number mm-hmm. two, we can't see every movie. It's not possible for us to see every single movie that comes out in a year. So. I don't know. I think Justin and I put in a good clip. I, I Brian agree. does too. You you yeah. you see like well, four years. We didn't now. say this is the worst movie made this year. We all I, I think we always couched it in. Yeah. Of the movies we saw this year, this mm-hmm. was the one we disliked the most. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean if that's I had why... seen every movie, it would have been three three fucking stooges that would have gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> and you haven't even seen it. Nope. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Look, it, it's one of those things where everybody has best of lists, and you know what? We we're not CNN. Uh, we don't have to be polite about stuff. And the honest to God's truth is, if a movie sucks, they don't call it out enough. Not enough times do people call it out and say, that movie fucking sucks. They just say, oh, it was bad or this and that. And they never call it the worst movie of the year. We can do that because we can do whatever we want. Mm-hmm. So it's nothing against the art or the, or the artists that are trying to make it. But if they didn't make it well, in our opinion, then you know, so so it goes. Mm-hmm. Scotty, for interesting for, conversation. And the honest thing is, Moonrise Kingdom did get a lot of good reviews, a lot of raves. Uh, it was actually a financial hit, very independent financial hit, small hit. Mm-hmm. But Scott hated it. For whatever reason, he went, and it just made him miserable. And that's that's always subjective. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people probably like Moonrise Kingdom, and obviously did. That doesn't mean Scott's wrong or, or you're wrong. It just means difference of opinion. I'm in the well, minority, and I fully Scott's agree. probably wrong. Though. Yeah, yeah, it's he probably is. He probably is. Granted, that happens more than the other, but <laughs> yeah. But see, the dictator I said was the worst movie of the year, and it was. <laughs> I'm sorry if if people don't understand that, but it it truly was. You know, and and Total Recall was probably my most disappointing, honestly, uh, because I really liked some parts of it, but it didn't do what I wanted out of it. Did you have a biggest disappointment, Scott? I'm, I mean, out of the five movies you saw? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, mine would probably be the same because I went into that movie with such high expectations. It got it was getting glowing reviews. Everyone were telling me, you have to see this. It's so good. It got glowing reviews. It was pretty average down the middle. Moonrise Kingdom? Oh, my Moonrise, Moonrise Kingdom. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, like, I mean, everyone was telling me, you have to see this movie. So I, w- I was like, I've seen Wes Anderson movies. I'm not a fan. This must be the one that's going to turn me around, and I could not wait to see it. And I mean, it would be the same for me. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not trying to p- piss off Jesse here. You know, a dog in a movie she doesn't, that, that she obviously really likes. But it, when we talk about worst movie of the year, in my mind, I'm thinking, what is the movie that you saw that you had the worst experience seeing in a film? That's fair enough. And that is that was unless a kid pees on you, because that's not the movie's <laughs> fault. Right. That's the parents' fault. <laughs> Always blame the parents. Did that happen to you? <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Okay. I, I get what she's oh. saying, though, as far as most disappointed, but in, in this idea, I think it's more worst experience as opposed to which did I, uh, which the which one has the biggest gap between my expectations and what I actually experienced. What, and, about, what about you, Brian? What was your most disappointing movie last year? It was a tie, and it was actually pretty much the same ones that Jesse mentioned. That was Prometheus and, and Batman. Hmm. I just didn't, I just didn't, you know, it's... That's one of the reasons I liked Avengers so much was that with all the hype, it lived up to it and even exceeded it. Hmm. Batman just didn't live up for me personally, and this is my own two cents, mm-hmm. uh, just didn't live up to the anticipation. It didn't live up to, I mean, if you recall when the trailers came out, I I was the only one basically that said I wasn't excited about it, you know, going off of the trailer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Prometheus was pretty much a letdown. Uh, very pretty, probably one of the just the most stunningly beautiful movies of the year. Vis- you know, visually speaking, special effects speaking. You know, but overall, it it when you when you connect it with the Alien universe, then the and Alien universe being the the movies, it just didn't live up to it. So it was just. Uh, 
I just wanted more from both of them. Yeah. And I didn't, and I don't feel like I, you know, don't feel like I got it. I think it's more so with Prometheus because there was a lot more elements of Dark Knight Rises that I liked. But yeah, Prometheus was my most anticipated movie of the year, and I just felt I did not get what I wanted at all. Well, I tell you, uh, Justin's going to try and catch it. I'll try and catch it. One of us will try and catch it before next week's show. So whoever it is, it'll probably be me because Justin will do it just to piss me off. He'll call me on Wednesday and say, yeah, didn't get around to it. Sorry, Bob. (laughs) Um, Okay, let's wrap it up. You can always stay through the credits for outtakes. Uh, You can find us on the web at thehollywoodoutsider.com, facebook.com forward slash thehollywoodoutsider. Please go there and like us, even if you don't care what we have to say. (laughs) Email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com if you have any topic ideas or you want to uh, ask ask us some questions or have us riff about something, tell your friends, man, please. Subscribe on iTunes, Zoom, Google Reader, listen on your Stitcher Radio app. And please, when we say that, please subscribe because, you know, when you subscribe, you download it. Maybe you listen to it, maybe you don't, but you subscribe and we appreciate it. And any plain old RSS feed, as well as RockfordCollegeRadio.com, Thursdays from 4 to 6. I want to thank each of the podcasters. Brian Williams, thanks for being here. I know you are tired. You've had a long day, sir. Yeah, yeah. Just and just a reminder: next week I will be recasting Reservoir Dogs. Yep. So, Mister White, Orange, Blonde, and Pink. So check that out. And just I like Brian. He's plugging himself. It's fantastic. <laughs> he's taking a he's taking a note from McCumber. He's <laughs> like, look, let's let's make this about me for a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, Justin McCumber, who is Minor Magic, is available now on Amazon paperback and Kindle, as well as Haywire. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. I'm glad you're back. I was afraid you were eating some snacks or taking a potty break. <laughs> nah, I, I wear it depends when I come to do this show. I appreciate, I appreciate the dedication, man. Mm-hmm. And Scotty Clark. Thanks for having me, man. And thanks for uh, Vegas. Thanks for the tiger. <laughs> the um, tiger. By the way, we, we had a debate. Wow, that sounds like there's a story we're missing. <laughs> no, unfortunately, there's not. We had a debate. Yeah, wait a minute. We're, we're talking about kids peeing on you and tigers. What? Yeah, that sounds like what, a good weekend, did, doesn't it? What did we miss? I got a question. In you, your your two's opinions. Your out of, two's opinions. Okay. Out of use two's opinions. This should be like speaking English for you, Brian. Use two's opinions. <laughs> who would be Phil and who would be Stu from The Hangover between me and Scott? Or Scott and I, as it were. I think, uh, it, I, I think you'd both be the guy that you hardly ever see in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be the naked Asian guy. <laughs> I thought it was a fair question. I just want to know who do you think would be Phil and who do you think no, would you be don't, Stu? You don't, you don't pose it and say which of these which of the two of nope. the four characters you got to say? Of the because those are the two that really only matter. Because I can't be an Asian because my penis the, is the, huge. The guy, the real sexy guy, was man of the year on People's Man of the Year, or the the dumb guy that does comedic relief and has his tooth knocked out. Which one do you think is? I just don't want to be the fat guy. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess you guys don't want to answer that. So yeah, that was kind of a dumb question. Go fuck yourself, <laughs> San Diego. <laughs> See, I know which one Scott is, but. I'm not going to answer that because it would default to the other guy being you, and I don't see you as him. So hmm. Hmm. I plead the fifth. Well, come back next week. We will have reviews for – what are we going to have reviews for? Gangster Squad. Gangster Squad and Zero Dark Thirty. There you go. Yeah, thank God Scott's here. He's got it, he's got it on the ball. <laughs> Remember, next time you guys go to the theater, buy popcorn. Now, that is some fucked up shit. <laughs> <laughs> How much does that cost? Sixteen, fourteen hundred. I didn't see the price point on it, but that just that wow. Fourteen hundred thousand. That's right. <laughs> lots of money, man. Lots of money. There's a lots of commas in that price, motherfucker. <laughs> and I love sweet tea. Mm, my grandma makes the best sweet tea. My grandma doesn't because she's dead. She's making it with Jesus. <laughs> Did I tell you what I heard in the casino? The funny, funniest thing when Sean and I were down there, hmm. these two guys were walking by, and uh, and one of their I don't know their wives or whatever was yelling at them or something, and they actually said like very quiet. I mean, she wasn't yelling, but she, they were fighting, and she said, "What would Jesus say?" That's what I assume because he was down at the bar so late, and his buddy just says, "Ow, ow, ow, ow." <laughs> <laughs> We passed in the hallway. Yeah, we we we're going to, and I don't want to get bore you with a bunch of Vegas stories. The um, Too late. And fuck off. Why don't you tell me about your writing? <laughs> Ow. <laughs> 
Okay, I saw Arbitrage, which is about a Richard Gere is a filthy rich. God damn it! Fucking <laughs> cock, cock in your mouth. Apparently. <laughs> All right. Good lord, because you just keep tripping over that freaking purple helmeted soldier that's dangling around your mouth. <laughs> That brain, that vein just pulsing too hard. Good, exactly. Good <laughs> lord, that vast deference is tripping up your tongue. Dude. Oh, fuck. <laughs> okay, but I did see Arbitrage, which is about uh, a filthy rich. F- <laughs> 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 but I did see Arbitrage, which is about a filthy rich uh, <laughs> head. F- <laughs> <laughs> head. <laughs> That was not you? No, nope. no, that is some fucked up shit. <laughs> Cocksucker. Let's see. You're probably looking at Scotty. <laughs> so, hang on. That wait, 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 wait a minute. Let, let me, I could, I, I might have this, I might have this narrowed down. Hang on. I'm having a Sherlock Holmes moment. <laughs> I, I didn't do it. You're looking at Scotty. You're asking. So you probably didn't do it. I'm, I'm, Hang on, I'm almost there. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Okay, for three, take carry the two. Uh, whew, shit, Justin probably. I'm gonna I'm gonna say Justin did it. Was that you, Justin? Oh, no, that is some fucked up. Get it out of 